Hello everyone and welcome back to Neuropsychology. So in this video we are going to start off the chapter about memory. So in this video we will talk about the introduction to memory, memory encoding, memory retrieval, different kinds of memory, and then we're going to start talking about one of the kinds of memory, um, which is explicit memory, which consists of episodic and semantic memory. And then we are going to dive a little bit deeper into a structure that is really important for memory, uh, specifically the hippocampus. And then we're going to talk about um, the cortices nearby the hippocampus called the rhinal cortices. Okay, so when we encode, store, and retain information in our brain, we create a memory. And this information can be accessed whenever we think about that specific stimuli or that event. Recollections are collections of neurons with strengthened connections to one another. So recall in memory refers to the mental process of retrieving um, information that has been stored. Along with encoding and storage, it's one of the three core processes of memory. And an engram is the change in the brain which accounts for the creation and existence of that specific memory. So technically, it's the neural substrate of a memory trace. Before we can have memories, we have to first create them, right? So we call this part memory encoding. So here, information that we perceive will have to be converted into neurobiological construct in the brain. So first it will go to our short-term memory. And next we want to convert this short-term memory into our long-term memory. So this can be done in various ways, but often it's done uh, through rehearsal or chunking. So chunking is a term referring to the process of taking individual pieces of information, so technically chunks of information, and then grouping them into larger units. So you associate them with more um, pieces of information. And by grouping a, each piece of information into a larger whole, you can improve the amount of information you can remember. So everything's associated. And then a the second one is what you uh, do very often when you're studying. So that is rehearsal. And we can use rehearsal to convert the short-term memory into a long-term memory. So this is when we keep repeating the stimulus so we consolidate it into our long-term memory. So we keep going over the material. So for example, when you're studying for neuropsych and you are trying to get all the facts about the hippocampus in your head, you just keep reading over them or re-watching the videos until you get it. So the process from converting short-term memories into long-term memories is called memory consolidation. So after our memories are consolidated into long-term memory, um, then it's stored in your brain. So I believe that whenever you store a memory in your brain, it will always be there. And sometimes you will have difficulty accessing it but whenever you store memory, it is forever in your brain. So whenever you remember something or think of a memory, you are retrieving this neurobiological memory construct in the brain by accessing this piece of information that you stored. So technically, you can see it as like a library. In the library, you have all these books, and every book would be um, a piece of your memory or a specific memory. So whenever you want to um, retrieve that memory, you have to go to the library and you have to actually grab the specific book that you want to read, or in this case, think about. During memory retrieval, the brain will replay a pattern of neural activity that was created when you perceived um, some sensory stimulus or event. So this is really important. So. It often isn't exactly the same, um, this pattern, but it is very, very similar. So technically, it's making a copy of your perception and it's trying to access that copy during retrieval. So there are multiple theories on this, but when I believe that when you retrieve a memory and you store it back into your long-term memory, these memories are not identical and they can be changed. 
So again, you store your memory into your long-term memory. And then when you retrieve it, you make a copy of what you have stored. And whenever you put it back, you put the copy back um, next to the actual memory. So it's actually fairly easy to implant memories into someone's long-term memory, even with something as easy as repetition. So this is why eyewitness testimonies are often not very reliable. So if you Google uh, eyewitness testimonies and um, implanting memories, you can see a lot of studies that have been done on this. Okay, so we have different kinds of memory. Of course, we have our short-term memory, and then we have our long-term memory. And then we can divide long-term memory up into three subparts. So we have explicit or conscious long-term memory. We have implicit long-term memory, which is non-conscious. And we have emotional long-term memory, which again can be split up um, in conscious and non-conscious. And often these memories um, are both. So explicit memories can be split up into two further subparts. So explicit memory can be split up into episodic memory and semantic memory. So let's go over these um, one by one. So let's start off with explicit memory. Okay, so explicit memory, you can split it up in episodic memory and semantic memory. So episodic memory is uniquely different from other neurocognitive memory systems in that it is memory of life experiences centered around the person himself or herself. So this information includes events and fact, um, and therefore episodic memories. So it is a conscious in uh, intentional remembering of events, facts, and knowledge. So episodic memory includes the autobiographical information. So technically, the who, what, where, when, and why. Episodic memory also includes autonoetic awareness of time. So we talked about this a tiny bit previously. But autonoetic awareness is self-knowledge, and autonoetic awareness of time allows us to travel in subjective time, either in the past, so we can think about the past, or in the future, so we can kind of think what's going to happen in the future. So this is also called mental time travel. And mental time travel is a memory ability that is characterized um, in humans, but not in non-human animals. And it also depends on maturation. So therefore, babies and very young children, they cannot use mental time travel. So the ventral prefrontal cortex and the medial temporal lobe are very important for episodic memory. And actually also the thalamus. So these two areas of the brain are connected by the uncanate fasciculus. Okay, that's a strange word. Okay, so here you see the ventral part of the frontal lobe, and then here you see the uh, temporal lobe. And then in blue, you can see these fibers, which will form the uncanate fasciculus. So the temporal lobe and the ventral frontal lobe are connected by this structure. And these structures are very important for episodic memory. So the unconnected fasciculus allows for communication between these two structures. So here you see an actual picture. This is a DWI picture, a diffusion weighted image, and someone did a tractography analysis on it and this is what the uncanate fasciculus looks like um, in this person's brain or in an average brain. So the other part of explicit memory um, is called semantic memory. So semantic memory is all the non-autobiographical knowledge, such as recognizing family and friends, um, information you learn in school, for example, reading, writing, math, and also knowledge about um, historical facts or events and figures. 
So knowing, for example, who Charles Darwin is, is a semantic memory. So not only is semantic memory different from episodic memory, it does not depend on the medial temporal lobe ventral prefrontal lobe memory systems that is important in episodic memory. So rather, semantic memory depends on the temporal and frontal lobe regions that are adjacent to the neural regions important for episodic memory. So the general anatomical areas of explicit memory are the hippocampus, rhinal cortices next to the hippocampus in the temporal lobe, and the prefrontal cortex. So nucleus of the midline thalamus also participate as they make a big connection between the prefrontal cortex and the temporal lobe structures. So the regions that make up the explicit memory circuit retrieve input from the neocortex and from the ascending system in the brainstem. So this includes um, the acetylcholine, the serotonin and the noradrenaline activating systems. So here you see a bunch of these anatomical subparts. So let's go over these brain structures in more detail. So we already covered the hippocampus broadly, but let's dive a little deeper into the anatomy of it. So hippocampus means seahorse in Greek, as we already talked about. And the hippocampus is a limbic structure that extends in a curve from the lateral neocortex of the medial temporal lobe towards the brain's midline. And it's kind of like a tube. It has a tube-like um, shape. So it consists of two gyri. It has the Ammon's horn and the dentate gyrus. So each gyrus contains specific type of cells. So Ammon's horn contains pyramidal cells and the dentate gyrus are stellate granuli cells. So the pyramidal cells of Ammon's horn are divided in four subgroups. So we have uh, CA1, CA2, CA3, and CA4. And then in the middle you have dentate gyrus. So the hippocampus is um, reciprocally connected with the rest of the brain through two major pathways. So one is called the perforin pathway, and one is called the fimbria fornix. The perforin pathway connects the hippocampus to the posterior temporal cortex. And the fimbria fornix connects the hippocampus to the thalamus, the prefrontal cortex, the basal ganglia, and the uh, hypothalamus. So within the hippocampus input from the neocortex, um, first it goes into the dent dentate gyrus, and then that projects to Ammon's horn, or to these CA regions. So the granuli cells are technically the sensory neurons of the hippocampus, and the pyramidal uh, neurons are more the motor cells of the hippocampus. So definitely remember that. The granuli cells are the sensory neurons of the hippocampus, and the pyramidal neurons are the motor cells of the hippocampus. So CA1 cells, then... Um, after it goes all the way to CA1, they will project, project to another part of the temporal lobe called the subiculum. And the subicular cells project back to the temporal cortex and forward to the thalamus and the brainstem. So here you see the hippocampus, here you see the amygdala, here you see the fimbria fornix, and here you see the cingulate uh, gyrus or cortex. So this is located medially in the brain. We already talked about this, but let's go over it a little bit more. And then you have the perforin pathway going away from the hippocampus. So here you have a coronal slice, and here um, you see the hippocampus right here in blue. And if you would look in that in detail, you have the dentate gyrus, um, then the information goes to CA4, CA3, CA2, and eventually to um, CA1. Okay, so a little recap. So the perforant pathway connects the hippocampus to the posterior, per, um, sorry, to the posterior temporal cortex, and the fimbria fornix connects the hippocampus to the thalamus, prefrontal cortex, basal ganglia, and hypothalamus. 
So within the hippocampus input from the neocortex, um, it goes into the dente gyrus, which protects to the Ammons horn. And then the Ammons horn, or specifically CA1, will project to the subiculum. Okay, so flow of information hippocampus, it goes to the dente gyrus, then to CA4, CA3, CA2, CA1. So this orange part is the hippocampus. And then it goes to this structure called the subiculum, which is not part of the hippocampus, but it is part of the hippocampal formation. So definitely remember that the hippocampus is the dente gyrus, CA4, 3, 2, and 1. So studies of hippocampal patients allow us to draw conclusions that anterograde memory is more severely affected than retrograde memory whenever the hippocampus is um, affected. Episodic memories are more severely affected than semantic memories. Autobiographic memories um, are severely affected as well. And mental time travel is diminished. Okay, so temporal lobe areas bordering the rhinal fissures include the perirhinal cortex and the entorhinal cortex. So these cortices provide major routes of neocortical input to the hippocampal formation. So here um, in green, you see the entorhinal cortex. It is on both sides, so it's bilaterally, but they did not show that because they also wanted to show the hippocampus and the amygdala, which is a little bit deeper. And then you see here in gray the perirhinal cortex. So input from the sensory areas um, in the cortex flows to the um, medial temporal cortical, perihippocampal, and perirhinal regions. And then it goes to the entorhinal cortex. And from there, finally, it will go into the hippocampus. So the hippocampus then feeds information back to the medial temporal, uh, temporal cortical regions. Okay, so that was a lot of information and anatomy. So I highly recommend going over the videos and slides again, or a couple times, before moving on to the next videos. Okay, so I will see you in the next video.